welcome everyone to our panel talk, breaking down barriers and discussing anxiety, fear and the mind. I am Petra Brennbauer and we are delighted to have you all here today as we embark on this insightful journey into the complexities of the human mind and its profound connection to anxiety, fear and mental health. In today's fast paced and interconnected world, mental health has become an increasingly critical topic of discussion and anxiety and fear in particular can affect every aspect of our lives, influencing our thoughts, our emotions and our actions. And yet they often remain shrouded in stigma and misunderstanding. And so our purpose today is to break down those barriers to shed light on the intricate workings of the mind and to foster a deeper understanding of anxiety, fear, and their impact on our lives. We have gathered a group of esteemed experts today who will share their knowledge, experiences, and insights on this crucial topic. And throughout the next 90 minutes, we will delve into the multifaceted nature of the mind, explore the intricacies of consciousness, and examine the factors contributing to anxiety and fear. Our panelists will provide valuable perspectives, evidence-based research, and practical strategies to cope with and overcome these challenges. So by the end of this panel talk, we hope to equip you with a greater understanding of the mind and its relationship with anxiety and fear. And we aim to empower you to engage in open conversations, to prioritize mental well-being, and to break free from the limitations that anxiety and fear can impose on your life. So without further ado, let's introduce our panelists who will guide us on this enlightening journey into the depth of the mind, mental health and consciousness. So first up, we have Shima Shadru. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you so much, dear Petra, for inviting me here to be part of this amazing topic that actually is um, super important for us living in a fast-paced society in um, this this level that the technology is advancing and insecurity and the, the future that humanity is facing and uh, the stress is predominant these days and i think we need to attend mental health and uh, find solutions practical solutions to address the stress that is underlying cause of over 97% of the disease. So I'm very delighted to be here today and share this information with you and your dear audience. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Shima. It's such a pleasure to have you here and to collaborate with you again. And Dr. Kaelin, welcome as well. It is fantastic to have you here also. And, and we have done some work together before also. And it's great to have you here. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm also so grateful to be here. This topic is near and dear to my heart. And one of the most important things I think in the world is working with the mind, anxiety, our emotions. I see it as the basis to all things in our lives, whether we acknowledge it or not. And we're continually learning more and more how to work with it, how to work with the mind, the things that we're going to talk about today. I'm a doctor of Chinese medicine, and I'm also an intuitive life and business coach and intuitive healer. But my passion really is working with people at the depths of who they are. And that's when we will run into anxiety and fear and those types of things, no matter what it is that they are looking for help with, whether it's to build their business or to heal their bodies or anything in between. And so that to me, to be able to have this conversation today, I feel like we're on the leading edge of it right now. And so I'm really excited to be here and to normalize any experience that we have emotionally and to validate it and to let it move through us and teach us and expand us. And the more that I think that we can do that, the better off humanity will be. I really feel like that this type of conversation is the one that has the potential to heal truly the world. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with you. And the importance of this is, is getting more important every day as more people like Shima said experience these inordinate levels of stress in their lives and they experience situations that often we as a generation haven't even experienced before like war and economic difficulties so 
there are a lot of things in this world at the moment that are affecting how people feel and how they experience our world. So such an importance on talking about this, like you said, normalizing it and also bringing some um, insight into what science says about all of this. What can we do about this? These are some important things that we also need to talk about. Mm -hmm. So welcome to both of you and thank you so much for joining us today. And for starters, let's talk a little bit about the mind because that is sort of the glue that's going to connect together everything that we're going to talk about. So let's let's talk about how we see the mind, um, how we connect the mind to the things that we're going to talk about and, and how do we, in the work even with clients and with other people, how do we address and look at the mind in the face of the challenges that people are experiencing? So Shima, would you like to start us off? Sure. So um, as business and life empowerment coach and tra trauma therapist and holistic health therapist actually working with individuals every single day, I can see most of our issues over 97% of our issues are directly connected to our mind, which we have scientific studies are sharing the information about the stress itself, how much side effect can create in our body. 97% of our physical disease are rooted back in stress, Alzheimer, dementia, heart attacks, cancer, all of them are directly connected to stress and we are not attending it. So when we go to the doctor, when we go to the normal conventional health system right now, and we are uh, having some uh, physical issue imagine with cancer, nobody is looking at the root cause of the disease. It's only 3% of, um, of patients are receiving stress management techniques, yet 97% of disease are directly related to stress. So, for uh, those of you who are not familiar with how the mind works and how this stress can really create disease, physical disease in our bodies, I would like to just explain a little bit. When you have a thought in your mind, that thought is creating chemical reaction in your body that uh, can be the hormonal response to that thought. And it could be sometimes uh, cortisol or adrenaline or other stress hormones. If you have that thought, for a long time in your mind, that means that stress hormone is produced for a long time in your body, changing the pH of the cell of your body. And instead of having a normal or a neutral pH ambient in your, in your, if, in your body, if it goes too acid or too alkaline, other disease can develop in the body. So the thought directly is related to changing the pH in your body. And uh, that plays a big role in your health. So we know, uh, for instance, if in, the, in the case of cancer, which is called incurable disease, we know that cancer cell cannot survive in alkaline ambient. We have scientific studies where scientists took the cancer cell and uh, from, from the body and put it in an alkaline ambient and it died by itself without any chemical, we don't, we don't need any chemotherapy or any surgery or anything else. We need to change that ambient. Now, we can change that ambient by nutrition, we can change that, that ambient by um, using alkaline diet, but as long as we have not changed the thought, we are not gonna have any success that every result that we get is just short. And what you hear out there a lot about alkalinizing the body through nutrition is really good, but it becomes a big marketing because nobody mm -hmm. talk about what is the thought before. We have all this marketing about alkaline water. That's amazing, it's great. It's great to pay attention to the quality of your water. But the first very important matter to pay attention to is that acidic thought. So human being has between 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts per day, and over 85% of them are negative. 95% are repetitive. So when I have repetitive negative talk per day, and that is all negative thoughts and negative self-talk per day, that is all causing the, um, the stress hormones in my body, and that 
uh, make my body to be a good host for all type of viruses and bacteria and different diseases. So it's a very important matter to then to go back to see, okay, how can I manage my thought? How can I manage my mind? And how can I manage my emotions? And this should be the topic of normal primary school. Mm -hmm. And this should be a topic that we can teach our children instead of like to develop tools that to manage their mind and manage their environment instead of growing up and see the result in such a like stressful society that we are living in. So um, that's uh, in my eyes is one of the most important part to attend actually. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. And thank you for explaining that mm -hmm. uh, because it highlights the importance that the mind plays and really everything else that happens in the body and, and really in our lives. And Dr. Kalen, how do you work with, with your clients when it comes to the mind? How do you approach that? Um, good question. Also loved that entire explanation and emphasizing the port, uh, importance of education around all of this because it happens from our whole lives. You know, as, as soon as we can receive information and the mind is activated, now, now the conditioning and all that begins. And so to me, I use the mind as um, the entry point into who somebody is, but who we are is so many things. And we have many voices in our head. Um, everyone I work with has some, some experience of trauma. I mean, so many of us do, right? From something that seemed sort of benign to them to something that, you know, totally destroyed what felt like their lives. And we must... We must work with the mind in order to help somebody heal and create the things that they want in their lives. And so I use really intuitive, gentle, and validated, like validating conversation that weaves into somebody's mind so they can have the awarenesses and the revelations and the epiphanies on their own. And it's so much of an untangling process where they finally get to see those inner workings that are so hard for us to see on our own. I do not think we can do this by ourselves. And then once they can start untangling it and their higher level awareness, which we'll talk about later, consciousness can observe it. Now you get to make choices from that truth of who you are about what you want to do with all of this mind, all of these constructs. And it can be complex, but it can also be pretty straightforward and simple once you really look at it. And then we use that to help them do whatever it is they're looking to do. But if it is not taken apart, the body will not heal and the things they want, want will not come. And even if it looks like they do, they will fall apart in some other way. And then that frustration of somebody feeling like they can't get to where they want to be or they're continuously in their own way just reinforces the negativity in the mind, you know? So we're really pulling them out of that whole trap. And it's a ton of learning. It's a ton of reconditioning. And it's a, an enormous amount of liberation, you know, I think, because then you get to to be the awareness and more of the controller of everything um, versus being in that autopilot state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of things that, that come up when you talk about that. So when we talk about change and plasticity, obviously in the mind, there's been a lot of talk time times ago that we can't change. We cannot change our brain. It stops changing after we are teenagers and we kind of are stuck with what we have. So we know now that that is not true and that we can change. My, what I'm wondering is, is it possible that we can control these changes? Because a lot of people would posture that thoughts are kind of an unconscious thing, that we can't consciously control this process. So how do we consciously work towards making these changes that will help us get positive changes in the mind going? Also, like Shima talked about, um, you know, that we, we have so many negative thoughts every single day that are repetitive. How mm -hmm. do we take control of that process to really take advantage of the plasticity that we are capable of throughout our lives? Yeah. Anyone wants I, to jump in? <laughs> yeah, I, had to, I have one thought around that. And it's, to me, that is my full-time job. So I, and I'm, I must, I must pay attention. I must stay aware. I must be in myself and in my body. I must practice meditation. I must do these things and cultivate these things and not 
let them slip away too much because then you get pulled back in. And so in my opinion and what I work with everybody around is that coming from that place of awareness, awareness of the mind, um, we'll probably talk about this later, but, you know, having good boundaries, um, being really mindful about where you're putting your attention. And it's easy to forget. It's easy to fall back in. But to me, the full-time job of my life existence is to stay inside of this awareness as best as I can year after year. And then from there, I can cultivate more deeper practices. I can do more. I can untangle more. You know, more just starts to click and shift because you're also still living your life actively in real time. So there's still more to process. There's still more coming at you. There's still more stress. So yes, you've gotten something straightened out over here, but now this other thing happens. So I really emphasize the importance of presence and meditation, which doesn't necessarily mean your eyes closed, but just that you are here and present to life and aware and staying connected with compassion to yourself so you can be in that relationship. And from that, I think any practice you layer on top of that will be very effective. But when you let yourself get pulled back in and kind of numb out, you, you got to kind of come back to the basics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shima, what are your thoughts on absolutely. taking charge so of the awareness. positivity? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, uh, awareness uh, is the first step. Really the first step becoming aware of the side effects of the thoughts, of the thoughts that are not managed by us on our health. That's a very first step. And understanding how far they can go. Like, because we are not educated, as you mentioned, a lot of material that we have learned, we have to relearn. So we need to just start to relearn from the beginning, from scratch, all the things that we have learned wrongly at school. And that's a, um, that's a surprising challenge. And at the same time, I would find it uh, really exciting because a lot of a lot of material we learned that were not really truth, not based on the truth. A lot of our conventional medicine is based on uh, mechanical physics. And since we discovered quantum physics and interconnectivity and the relationship between thoughts, the, between the mind and emotion and the body and every organ in our bodies, then we know that what we are teaching at our medical schools are no longer valid. The way we are teaching, we need to to update all this information. Now, to the public, what we are teaching also is not valid. And we need to relearn. So become aware, understanding how the thought is affecting our body, how that emotion is being stored in every cell and or every organ in our body and blocking the energy flow in our body. So an emotion code, as Dr. Bradley Nelson is talking about, and I'm a practitioner of emotion code and body code as well, it's very similar to Chinese medicine because it's one of the um, foundation of emotion code is basically Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine is over 5,000 years. This is amazing information that they have over 5,000 years. And our conventional medicine has only 200 years of information. So we shouldn't throw away all those information that are gem and just rely on our 200 past 200 years of studies, which I don't say here, just want to um, make the point that we need to merge these two together. We don't want to throw away, throw away all the scientific advances and discoveries that we had, but we want to merge them together and bring our science in the service of our heart and our, of our spirituality and connect these two brain our, and mind, science and spirituality together. That's the only way we can attend true health because we need to understand as Dr. Kalins mentioned, that's who we are. That's the very first thing. And if we learned wrongly who we are, then mm-hmm. that affects influence everything in our life, our health, our relationships, our finances, every single thing that we are facing in our life. So who we are, we are multidimensional beings. We are not only physical beings. We have mental body, physical body, emotional or energetic body, spiritual body, and these are all interconnected. Each experience on this body is affecting the other experience, the other part of the body. So when we have emotion that is trapped, is the size of a, a clenched fist and trapped and it's creating blockage in the meridian, the energy uh, 
channels of the body and that will cause uh, the development of disease. So if we attend that and we say, okay, like as um, Dr. Kelly also mentioned about the traumas, if we attend that trauma, if something happened that um, we don't want to be knowing and we just park it in our subconscious mind and or store it somewhere really far to not have access to that, that will create a problem. So first step is to become aware, see how they are working and how they are affecting us. And then second, once we become aware, uh, you are going to ask yourself, this is a methodology that I have shared also in my book that is very practical and I'm using it with my, many of my patients every day. So once you are aware of what is that thought behind that condition, that anxiety or panic or stress, whatever it is, first you bring awareness to that thought. And then once you, once you know what it is, you're going to tell yourself, I am in control. I am the one behind this thought. And this is only a thought and the thought can change. This is very powerful statement because until now you identify yourself with that thought as if that thought is you and therefore has such an impact in your life. Once you become an observer and once you verbalize this statement that this is only a thought and I am in control to change the thought. So you take step back disidentifying yourself from that thought, from that moment you have the power, you are the one taking control of your mind. Instead of being the victim of autopilot decisions taken on your behalf in the brain. Mm -hmm. So you take control and you say, okay, I can change it now. How can you change that? You're going to replace that negative self-talk, negative thoughts with a positive one or with a neutral one. Sometimes it's difficult to find a positive one. So for instance, somebody is looking at his bank account and is looking with, from a state of lack and what is seeing in the bank account is more bills that are coming and negative statement in the bank account. So in that, in that moment, if you tell to this person, okay, say that I'm rich and wealthy, that doesn't make any sense, right? You can't do that. You can't convert it to a positive one, but you can convert it to a neutral one. And, or you can convert it to something that I'm on the way. I'm along the way making my way up. Um, I'm making my way up. Or, or I'm just not letting this thought ruin me and change my reality. So I'm in control. I'm going to change that. Find that thought that is creating that emotion of anxiety or stress or whatever it is in your body. Become aware that you are the in control. Change that to something more positive. So that's one of the methodologies that really help. And then also learn all these stress management techniques as Dr. Kaling also mentioned meditation is the most powerful tool you can have. The reason that meditation is so powerful and there is a great resistance in the people in the society against meditation because people are uh, connecting meditation with religion. And as every day, more people are falling out of religion. So meditation is something becoming now growing and has a uh, growing number of people. But in general, people are uh, having kind of a um, resistance to one meditation. So what happened in, in the, how the mind works, that's very important for us to know. The mind is taking the decisions for us on an autopilot mode because we have thousands of data entering our mind every single second. So that data are processed by the brain and, 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 and sorted by the brain. Some of them are going to this folder and the other folder or to the trash folder or to the long-term memory and being sorted. Like when you start to learn how to drive, you sit in your car and you start to learn how to change the gear, how to press the gas pedal or to navigate and, and, and maneuver between all these different, uh, different tasks that you need to do, look into the mirror and, and all this stuff. And it's very difficult because you need to be really, really conscious about it. But after a while, once this become autopilot for you, then you can drive miles away without even paying attention. You didn't even know how did you get to your destination, right? So because this is something that mind and your brain is doing it for you. Every single decision that we are taking per day are taken by our mind six to seven seconds before we even become aware of it. And this has been published by scientific magazines. So we have scientific studies showing us that whatever decision you want to take, 
It's taken on your behalf by your brain. So if you really want to live consciously, if you want to really create a conscious change in your life, you do need to create a space to enter the data in your brain manually by meditating, creating that space. So you are the one in charge and calming your mind, creating that gap that you can enter this, that those data that can give you imme immediate power. As you're talking, I'm getting the sense of, of almost a bit of liberation and relief because if we're talking about re-education and we're talking about possibilities of change and actually taking control of what's happening in our mind that can then affect everything else in our lives, our thoughts, emotions, behaviors, everything, that's quite the freeing thought to think that we have this kind of possibility to make changes in our lives. Is, is that something that you work with with your clients also, Dr. Kalen, on just opening up, like Shima said, that space for creating possibilities that people can make positive changes and they can become sort of the, the cause um, end of the equation and not living in the effect all the time, just trying to react to what's going on. Do you work with that as well? Yeah, and the way you just explained it, I think, is is the point of that type of work, right? Because people will say, I've tried everything. I don't know what else to do. I feel stuck. Um, I'm not even sure what I want, or I don't know how to do this thing, right? So they're, what they want is not available to them for some reason. And then if we bring that back to the mind and to you know, this mental processing, the way they're making decisions, all of that, we must create a gap. Um, and we can do that through meditative practices on our own, through awareness, through energy work. So like the type of work that I do, um, whether or not we do the energy work directly in my office or I'm coaching somebody thousands of miles away, we're still working on an energetic level, which we can talk about another time, but we're creating space so we can perceive, so we can get ahead of it, so we can be decisive from a higher level awareness. And so we must untangle it and we must challenge those things, but in a way that it sounds more true to them than what they've been doing. And that's the fun of it is when it clicks in that, oh, this really isn't it. This is not the way, this is not what I want. I see this here because everybody's truth is different. It's not up to me to insert the truth into somebody. It's up to us to help clear things away so they can locate it for themselves. And so I think the way you described it is, is perfect because everything that we're going to do as healers, providers, coaches, et cetera, I think really is setting the stage inside of a container of time or a session or a program to help create that space and let everything get reorganized according to that person's intention and desire to help things reorganize and point them to where they want to go. And that can happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. Everything can, yeah, it can just collapse around it like that. And it doesn't even necessarily require a lot of mental processing on their part. In fact, we want to turn down the mental processing and the over analysis and the things they've been stuck inside of and create those gaps through interesting conversation or energy type of works that pull them back into all of the energetics that they are. So then their wisdom and their consciousness can grab the wheel and do it. And that's, what's really cool too, is they don't have to figure anything out. It starts mm -hmm. to occur to them, you know, mm -hmm. like that, that's at least the way I love working with it is that we don't even necessarily know what shifts need to take place and what the answers are, but they will come. And mm -hmm. it's, the easy way. It's a path of least resistance. And I always tell people, and I might've already talked about this in a previous interview, but you've worked hard enough. Now mm -hmm. you get to work less and things get to start working for you. And when the concept of relief, yes. Cause when you get into that gap, whether it's in meditation and everything drops away mm -hmm. or in that conversation or whatever, clarity comes, ease happens. And I think that is more of our natural state but most people are not in it and we're certainly not taught about it. So it doesn't seem natural to us and we don't even trust it. So yes, I absolutely resonate with that. Yeah, that's a good point. A lot of people are very suspicious when they're happy. <laughs> so, yeah, like, this is easy. something wrong with me. <laughs> so. I don't have to work at this, you know, it's like, yeah, it could just happen yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. that's part of the rethinking too, is, you know, thinking that we must struggle to achieve something because 
a lot of people when they're quite happy and their lives are going well they're always looking for that other shoe to drop you know like when when is this going to happen maybe a bit of a rethinking and re-education that that is actually the state that we're supposed to be in you know in that flow in that connectedness with what's around us and life actually maybe isn't supposed to be that much of a struggle or that much pain or that much negativity Mm -hmm. And that could be a, a good place also to, to start the rethinking and the, the reconnecting when we talk about that. Now, I mm -hmm. want to touch on, on one more thing to do with the mind. And that is something that Shima had brought up um, when you were talking about the mind and the organs. Now, do you want to touch a little bit on the heart-brain coherence? Because I think that's also an important thing we should mention before we go further and kind mm -hmm. of explain to our viewers what that is, what that means, and how that affects us when we talk about the mind and the body. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, we have scientific studies uh, by Heart Math Institute, published scientific studies talking about the discoveries of 40,000 neurons in our heart that think, act, and decide independently than our brain. And that is fascinating because until now, we believe that brain is the taskmaster of the body and is the one that managing everything. But when somebody has a brain death and, and is, a, is in coma, brain is not alive anymore, is completely gone, but the body can go on for ages. Like look at Michael Schumacher for four years in coma. How that happened is because of the heart continue to beat as long as the heart consider to be there and to be alive. So if you look at the uh, fetal development, you know, you see that the first organ in the fetus that starts its development is the heart, is not the brain. Brain only starts six to eight weeks after the heart development. So the, our very first brain actually is our heart. It has 40,000 neurons that receive the information from the environment, from the electromagnetic field around our body and from the electromagnetic field of our planet and act as a mirror, sending those information to our brain through the neurons. And brain will change that to the, to, the, to the language of the body, which is electricity, and will send to different organs the orders of releasing different hormones based on those information that are received by the heart. So these two organs should have a coherent uh, coherence, actually communication. If this communication is out of balance, we will experience a lot of imbalances. We will experience a lot of anxiety and, and stress and a lot of other disease in our body. So it's very, uh, very important to create a coherent level between this communication of our heart and our brain. And um, so we have a very um, simple and practical tool explained by HeartMath how to create it and the benefits of it. Once, when you um, mentioned, sorry, about the uh, neuroplasticity and you mentioned about changing our DNA, these are facts, these are real, these are not voodoo or something that we talk about, okay, some people, uh, they show resistance about, okay, what is the spirituality or we talk about energy. Here we talk about pure science, scientific studies that shows when you set an intention, you can change the DNA uh, strand, you can change the structure of the DNA, you can activate reverse aging in, aging in your body. And uh, this is really interesting information to know that you are not defined by all the genetic issues that you brought here and you were born with. You can change them all and get rid of them once you realize who you truly are. And once you realize the true power you have inside your heart to set a crystal clear intention and get rid of all those conditions. So yes, this is, this is very interesting co uh, topic. And, um, and, and I think it's, it's very interesting also to learn this simple tool by, by Heart Mass Institute, how to create the coherent communication between our heart and, and our brain. It's a very easy two, two minutes of steps, actually a uh, very practical tool that I use it in all my teachings and, and you can feel an immediate shift in your body. So did you want to talk about that tool now or do you want to leave that um, for a little bit later? 
we can share that a little bit later if you want. We can go Sounds continue good. the communication and we leave that for the for the end of our discussion so we can offer it to, to our yeah. to our audience. Yeah. Let's do that. I, I want to mention something here that also struck me as immensely interesting um, because I was talking to uh, Dr. Dawson Church, who was also in the summit, and he does a lot of work around um, thoughts to things and um, the mind and, and everything to do with what we've just talked about. And uh, they did studies uh, where they tested uh, people who are very um, successful in life, who have kind of achieved what they've set out to achieve, who have manifested what they've set out to manifest, be that wealth or health. And, um, and they studied these people to, to find out what the difference is. So why do some people struggle so much in life? And why do some people seem to be connected to this flow and everything comes very easily in, in their minds? And so they found that the electrical waves for the brain and the heart were actually in sync uh, for, for these, he calls them the master manifestors, but the people who seemingly move through life with ease and, and make a lot of um, impact on the world. And so I find that very, very fascinating that once we tune into that coherence between the brain and the heart, we almost seem to plug into that connectedness and that, that we're maybe meant to be in and life mm -hmm. opens up to us, life opens up the possibilities to us, mm -hmm. and we can actually maybe utilize the mind in a way that was designed for us to use, and that is to be healthy and happy beings experiencing this mm -hmm. life and this physical body. So yeah, so interesting, and, and thank you for talking about that. Yes, my pleasure actually um, to um, confirming what you just mentioned about this coherence in the people who are achieving their success and can man easily manifest what they want is that the discoveries of heart has also is showing you that your 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 heart is your tuning point into the field into this infinite realm of possibilities around you so every organ every alive every living organ it has electromagnetic field around it and heart has electromagnetic field around it that is 60 times electrically, 5,000 times magnetically greater than the electromagnetic field of the brain. So, and this, this uh, the electromagnetic field of our heart is mirroring our emotions to the environment around us. So that's why it comes to attract emotions. When you are around someone in two meter distance or one and a half meter distance, whatever emotional experiences they have in that moment, you can easily have a shared trapped emotions in your body that was not yours because you're receiving from them and your, your heart is communicating those information to you. So if you want to create a future, you want to manifest something, also you're tapping into this interconnectivity to the to this um, divine matrix, as Max Planck mentioned, uh, or, or call it about the, the field that is connecting us all together. And the way and the, to connect to that divine matrix, to connect and tap into this uh, dimension is through your heart. So once you create a coherence between your heart and your brain, you can send the signals, the real signals of what you want to manifest. And it's much easier for you to manifest and become a match to that vibrational reality once you have this alignment in you. Hmm. That's fascinating. I love talking about that. <laughs> so, um, and that maybe gives our viewers some thoughts, you know, on, on how they can go about making these changes as we're kind of exploring different directions and different ideas with them. Uh, now, the, the next thing I want to touch on um, is consciousness, because as we're talking about anxiety and fear and the mind and how all of these things are connected together, consciousness is one of those things that, um, you know, we hear a lot. I mean, almost mainstream now, we need to raise our consciousness, we need to raise the collective consciousness. But what does that even mean in relation to when we're talking about anxiety, fear, trauma, negative experiences, negative emotions? What does that even mean? And I know, Dr. Kaylin, you and I, we talked about the third energy of creation, which we, yeah. there seem to be these levels to it, right? So um, yeah. do you want to maybe dive into um, a little bit of, the, of consciousness and, and how you see that, what your perception of that is? How do you um, explain that? And do you see it in different levels? And how does that connect to what we're talking about today? 
I love it because I find it pretty inexplicable. It's that thing that so many of us have experienced in some way, but then we attempt to explain it um, through our thinking mechanism, right? <laughs> so, so many examples come to mind, um, but, you know, the one that I'm thinking of the most is in meditation, but particularly when I've had transcendent experiences in when I received acupuncture myself, you can move into, and I'm doing this because it's, that's the way it feels to me. And also I'm just sharing this from a very like layman's terms. Let's just kind of talk about it, different angles, right? Um, I'm not going to go into all the, all the, you know, I'm just going to share it from my perspective, essentially is what I want to say. Um, because I think we all have our unique experiences of this, you know, people that have had near death experiences, people that have had healing experiences, people that have had transcendent awakenings in which their whole life has changed in seconds, you know. Um, I have had such fascinating, as have my clients, experiences, for instance, in acupuncture, where this is why I love modalities like this so much, is because you leave the mind as you know it, you can, and you can move into what it obviously is a much more expanded awareness, this also can happen in meditation, where you are no longer identified with the small, predictable inner workings of your programmed mind, and you are inside of something vast, expansive, knowing, loving, seeing, and in that place, you may have visions. Your whole perspective on life may be different when you come back in. And they, I call them all very much transcendent experiences because they're not something that I've been able to achieve to live inside of at all times, but they have completely changed the way that I know reality to be and how I understand things to work. And then I, how I then see myself or how my clients then see themselves, their problems, their minds, et cetera. And it transcends fear and anxiety and all those things, because those are states, those are energetic states that we can get into or we can transmit to one another as we were just talking about. But when we can, as you described too, get in this gap, get in this expanded space. Um, Joe Dispenza talks about this a lot as well. If you wanna check out any of his work where you can move into something or the quantum field, something big, something beyond your identity, your, your personality, your physical body, and you're inside of the consciousness that none of us have really been able to fully explain from there, everything is so open, so free, so liberated that you can then see through all of the small little things that maybe you've gotten tangled up into, or you can have an experience like people do with psychedelics, for instance, that because it's an experience, then it gets actually stored in the mind. And now it's something that you've lived and now you can use it for your benefit. That's the really cool thing. I, I've not done psychedelics myself because I have a lot of these experiences on my own. But when I listen to clients that have had psychedelic experiences, you know, um, under like licensed care, for instance, they're having different experiences through consciousness that then change their brain, that then change their mind, that then change how they see everything. Mm -hmm. And I think it's tapping into that, that resource, that whatever you want to call it. We've, I did the thing about the third energy of creation, this other energetic, when you can tap into that, then everything has potential to change for you because you've had a new experience of what's possible, what is, et cetera. And things can be instantaneous, instantaneously healed. Revelations may come. I mean, you name it, but once we've experienced it, we know it and there's no way to not know it. And if you haven't yet experienced it, trying things like maybe some of the stuff we'll talk about later will help you bypass the little cage that can be the mind and help you tap into what it is that we really are that's being funneled through this organic being that we are yeah mm -hmm. well, i see you nodding <laughs> so jump in let us know i'm just connecting <laughs> to this <laughs> yes um beautiful Absolutely. It's, um, it's what I shared in my book, this consciousness is uh, this um, divine connection, what connect us all together as infinite love. That's the name of the book. That's the name of my resort and company and everything. 
It's uh, coming back to an experience that when you mentioned, and now I'm just feeling it in my body and would love to share that with you. When um, my mom has been uh, diagnosed with brain tumor and I was already helping many people with incurable disease, I was helpless toward my own mom because my family showed great resistance to my holistic approach to health. So in that frustration, not being able to communicate with my family and uh, seeing my mom going under aggressive medical treatment, six, six brain surgeries and two months of radiotherapy is, is killing her and uh, not being able to deliver my points. And she was my best friend, my soulmate, my role mother. I did not find myself a day that not I'm not talking about my mom. So it was very frustrating. It was, it was a moment of despair. It was a moment that I entered this, um, Real that nothing else mattered in my life. I could not imagine one day of my life without her. So in that moment, I I have decided to end my life. And I shared that story also in my book. And I I decided to take a lot of medicine and, and to finish finish this this suffering. That was a very deep suffering in me. And in that moment, I even wrote my goodbye letter. I kept it, I kept them until today because there are two goodbye letters to two very close friends of mine. And um, in that moment that I was rolling of pain in my bed and crying loud, literally two invisible arms. So now I'm not talking about an energy or a warm feeling. No, I'm talking about a hug from two invisible arms hold me so beautifully and whisper in under my ear, everything is going to be okay, my love. And that for me is all what exists. It's what it is. That's the unseen. That is all divine mother, infinite love. And that experience was euphorious i mean it was something that i can't i can't explain with no words we don't have enough words to describe that love because we don't have enough voice to i mean rumi um the famous persian poet of unconditional love wrote tons of books to describe a second of his connection with this divine love and how can i describe that but what i can say this was the most profound experience of my life that brought to my awareness all the spontaneous healing experiences that I had until then. And growing in a country that was, I was growing in, in, in Iran, I was born in Iran during the war between Iran and Iraq. In Tehran, growing six years, the very first six years of my life in conflict, bombs, under the bombs and attack and all this stuff after the Islamic revolution in Iran. So. I have seen the adversity right first at birth, and it was miraculous my entire life journey to be alive, to be alive by then when, when I decided, and this is five years ago, when I decided to end my life. I forgot all my spontaneous healing experiences. I forgot all those miracles and angelic beings around me. And that moment of awareness bring, brought, it was a flashback for me, bring me all those moments that I have been guided and protected and supported and loved by this divine, invisible being. So once, as Dr. Kelly mentioned, once you're touched, once you're kissed by this unconditional love, you can't be unkissed. Once mm -hmm. you know it, you can't forget it. And nothing can break that faith anymore, anymore. So all my life, I was trying to build my ideology, studying over 20 years different theologies and philosophy and, and going deeply into the science to create and develop an ideology, finally coming to this, that, the, that ideology is this infinite love, that we are, that this is what we are all connected to. As Petra mentioned beautifully at the beginning, maybe we are not here only for supper. Maybe we are, maybe there is something greater that we need to tap into that. And, and, and really, I'm here to share this with you, with all of you, that there is something greater. So don't, don't lose your hope if you are in, in your deepest sorrows, if you are in a challenging situation, if you're facing the loss of a loved one or, or something that you're really feeling that you, you can't deal anymore. 
any longer with this, don't lose your hope. You can do that because we are all connected to this love and all what it is, is this unconditional love and your real true power starts once you tap into this power. And that is the consciousness. What you bring is your consciousness is what you choose to be because you are a, you have always a free choice as a human being and that is your superpower. So as Einstein beautifully said, your entire life is based on this choice, whether you are living in a friendly world or in a hostile world. So if your world is hostile, know that you have a choice to live in a friendly world. And that's when you move into unconditional love, living and being surrounded by that love and, and creating a shift as we are all shifting to this new dimension, the fifth dimension. So that would be really beautiful to open yourself up and. And one of my prayers every single day, because every time you're seeking to have that connection back again, to, to, to experience that moment of the embracing that beautiful divine mother, divine love, is that every morning that I wake up, I try, I, I spend a minute to connect to this divine being and telling that, um, show me the signs that you are with me, show me the signs that I can't miss. And I want you to be with me. Well, I want you to guide me. I want you to show me the way. And I want to be um, at your service. Here, putting my ego aside, putting my identity aside, putting all what I identify myself aside, and being at the service of this unconditional love. Wow. Beautifully yeah. said. And thank you for sharing your practice with us as well. Uh, I think that's a great way to start or finish the day is, is in this gratitude and this deep connection of experiencing mm -hmm. that love. So wonderful. And there's a bit of a duality here. So we have this infinite love, this unconditional love on the one hand that this, the consciousness that is the source, whatever we want to call that or tap into that with. But then we also have many, many people who are experiencing the opposite, who are experiencing a lot of anxiety about the world today, who are experiencing fear for their lives, who are in war-torn areas maybe even, who simply don't have the means to even put a roof over their heads or feed their children. So we have a bit of this, this disconnect between this unconditional love and, and what people are experiencing. So maybe Dr. Kalen, do you want to talk a little bit about this anxiety and fear that people are experiencing it where does that come from and how does it disconnect us from the source and from this unconditional love how does that happen um i believe that anxiety and fear comes from people <laughs> um you know everything we just described now obviously even in the animal kingdom there's there's fear you know i think Fear is normal on some level. It's it's an emotion that we experience. And I certainly can only speak to the things that I understand, things that I know. I would never claim to know the suffering of somebody else, particularly if I hadn't gone through it. But I see it as maybe a few things. One is that it's generated from us. Two, as people, which I guess I can explain later if we want, but just people... A lot of the things you just explained are people hurting other people, you know, people not supporting other people, the trauma that lives on endlessly, you know. And then two is that we have nothing in place universally to support us through our anxiety and our fear. It is so intrinsic to humanity to be afraid, to be in scarcity to not be loved, which is wild because we just, well, that's in my opinion, obviously, but, um, but we just described this other energy that, that so many of us, of us have experienced and have been touched by our lives have been saved by mine as well, which is fascinating that you shared that. Um, it's why I'm still alive. So to see that disconnect and to know that it is real also really speaks to the, du the, the, du the nature of of life on earth, which is duality, right? We live inside of extremes. I mean, that is the basis of Chinese medicine, which is yin yang, which is not just a cute little symbol. I mean, it is it is how all things are merging together, being created and being destroyed inside of polarities. 
And so one, I think that it is natural because we live in a realm. Our reality is based on duality to some extent. Two, it is bred within us. It is passed on. It is just part of humanity. And also, I think too, um, we live in complete uncertainty, whether we know it or not. We live inside of the unfolding of the unknown, even though we live in cycles in some degree of predictability. Mm-hmm. And that's not often normalized either. It's not something that we wake up and are taught to celebrate it. But then again, that's why I think a lot of this comes from humanity itself. And the unknown is very scary to people. Um, and truly, not to be silly, but we are in space on a rock in an endless universe, which to the human mind is insane. And we're all trying to learn how to be in my, as far as everybody I know, how to be here, how to function here, how to survive here, and then how to thrive here based on what we're experiencing and the conditions that we're inside of. I mean, the levels of this are wild. So I think it's so, 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 so multifaceted, which then also emphasizes how you said, somebody said the word crucial earlier, um, how crucial it is that we tend to this with that love just about more than anything else. Because when it is not, when we are not shown safety, love, nurturance, protection, when we don't know how to provide that for ourselves, when we don't know how to find that with one another, this will just be perpetuating unendingly. Those are some of my thoughts on that. It's a big, it's a very big subject. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Super big and, I, absolutely. and something people grapple with all of their lives, you know, this for many people, this this never gets resolved um, until they pass on. They grapple with these these questions, these feelings, these anxieties all their lives. So it is it's definitely a huge impact on this world and a huge impact on people and how they live their lives or mm-hmm. what restraints they live their lives in, self-imposed or not. So, yeah. Uh, I would like to add something to that, uh, what Dr. Kaylin mentioned, and is absolutely true. Um, So this is, this is the the world, the the duality reality that we are experiencing, and we are living in it. And um, yes, being aware of it, that it's all these different vibrations, whether the vibration of uh, anxiety, or is depression, or is lack, or or fear, panic, insecurity exist simultaneously in this duality reality. There is nothing in this reality that we are having that doesn't have these both poles. Every single uh, molecule is based on atom, and inside every atom we have electron, we have neutron, we have proton. So we have this duality in every atom, and we are living on planet Earth and Mother Earth with like North Pole and South Pole, and the yin and yang and day and night all exist. So that's the very basic thing we need to understand, that this is there. And it's all about the vibration and the frequency. But as Nikola Tesla says, if you want to understand the secrets of life, you need to think about the terms vibration, energy, and frequency. So each of these emotions, they have a certain vibration, certain frequency, but you are in charge in changing them. So that's the important part about it. First of all, as Dr. Kelly says, many of this is created by us, but the most important part is creating in our mind. Because what is phobia? Phobia is just a thought that create so much stress reactions in our body. It's not about the event that is happening out there most of the time, it's about our reaction to that event. And it's always our internal state that uh, define how are we going to react and how we are going going to, to, to show up in the society. Imagine one morning you wake up and you wanna go to office and you're having a a really stressful day and you you got a really bad news and you had you had a fight at home with your with your partner uh listening to the screaming children or whatever scenario that you can visualize for yourself you get in your car with all that mindset driving and on the next junction somebody without uh, using the indicators turn in front of you and almost cause an accident what would be your reaction to that in that state of mind that you are full of stress and anxiety, probably you would head your, put your head out and shout and say something, right? Or you would not put your head out, but you would say something in your car. But definitely not a positive reaction. 
Now imagine you're waking up next to your lover, having an amazing romantic night, and you're having a beautiful breakfast together, sitting in the car, listening to your favorite song, and you're driving, and somebody does the same, the same scenario and uh, scene happen again. And what will be your, your, your reaction to that? Based on your state, your mental state in that moment, you may even have compassion for that for that person. You, you may think, oh, maybe they are running late to a meeting, or maybe they are taking someone to the hospital, and you give them the way to go. So it's not most of the time in our daily life about the events that is happening out there. It's about how we react to those events. So we are, if we understand how much power we have in changing and in changing our vibration in emotional state and mental state, then we can create a change in our lives. Knowing that we are the one in charge. So a lot of things are happening bigger and greater than me. There is where I need an ideology to connect that something when it happened to, to the loss of one of our loved ones. Definitely, you need a solid ideology in that moment to help you and, and, and save your life. Otherwise, it's going to be the growing number of suicides that we are hearing every single day, especially with countries that they don't have any, any solid ideology or belief about the life after death and something. It shows how much is important to have that solid ideology. That is missing today. And for, for me, as you say, this exists. Yes, this life, this despair, this anxiety all exists. It did exist in my life as well. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist now. It does. Until I had this connection with divine love, I was confronting them in a different way. Once I had this faith, once this faith started to grow inside me, then there are many things that I can't change it and I don't even intend to change it. I accept it as a part of the journey, right? But what can I change is my reaction to the situations. That's definitely something I can change. The event around me, I can't change, no. But when I change my reaction to those events, then my world around me will change. Because when the, you change the way you look at things, the things will change. And that is quantum physics. That's the famous sentence of Dr. Wayne Dyer, but that's quantum physics. That's we are talking about how much you as the observer changing the physical structure of a being. And, and that's your true power. So that's the, the whole idea is to bring in this to our awareness, understanding this is an extreme time of life to live. This is a very exciting time on confronting unknown before we could make, for instance, an investment plan for 10 years ahead, five years ahead, or having a vision that we're we gonna be in five years on or 10 years on, years on, now is impossible. Now the level of chaos and the level of changes in every single matter make it impossible to have kind of a known future. But we should remind ourselves when we were in the belly, in the womb of our mother, we did not have any worry. We never thought about what if my nose doesn't grow or what if I don't grow a hand. We trusted and we came out perfectly as we should be. Then what happened when we are at a certain age, then we are taking responsibility for our lives. We put our sleeves up and we say, I am here and I'm responsible and I'm the only one. That is something I did as well. And that is something that what Dr. Dyer mentioned about it, ego, aging God out. When you age the God out of, which is this divine love, out of your life, then yes, the level of anxiety is understandable. You can't really stand it. It's, 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 um, it's really can, can uh, be really killing us. But once you have this solid ideology and foundation and connection to what it is, what's the truth, to your truth, to your true inner truth, then you can confront whatever challenges that life brings you and, and you may laugh at them. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> wow. That's very profound. <laughs> Thank you for sharing <laughs> that. And you. you know, I, I wanna mention something because there may be some viewers watching this going, you know what, um, I'm a single mom living in my car. I'm looking for a job. I don't know how to handle this life. Like, how can we give hope 
to people on where can they start when they feel that there is uncontrollable things in their lives shima for you as well you you came from a war-torn area iran iraq right yes. how do we give hope to people when they're in these situations and and they they look at this panel talk and they go well that's great there's three people talking that have great lives so how do we connect with that how do we give them hope and and where should they start how how can we help I think the first thing that we can bring the hope is by sharing our stories, by sharing our vulnerability, by sharing where we have been and where we are and how we developed. It's just they can see as a life example there <laughs> that is a living example that this happened. And I shared a lot of difficulties of my journey in the book and how I overcome them. And the result of working with so many clients every single day, and this is what they're exp um, experiencing as well, this empowerment in their life. But also understanding that you are always in power, independent of everything that you have been uh, confronting in your past. In this present moment, you are the one in charge. And future is a repetition of the now. This is the power you have in this present moment to create a change you want in your future. So when I'm working with a lot of people with mental health and with labeling on mental health, that from, they come from mental rehab hospitals to me and they don't have any more hope to what to do. I say, listen, I don't care what kind of uh, labels they give you. I don't care the amount of medicine they prescribe you. What I care is that you are in power right now to create a complete different reality. So if you have a magic wand in your hand and you shake it and your ideal reality, imagine financial finances or relationship or health or whatever you want to achieve, happen without any worries, without any challenges, just in a blink of an eye, when you sh wave your magic wand, your ideal scenario is there. Describe me what would that be for you with details. Imagine like if um, you have all the labels of being mentally like dis disabled or, or I don't know, whatever they tell them. Then they will start to, to look from a different perspective. What is the future they want to build? And then from there, you are going to go and see, okay, what are the challenges we are facing? How can we overcome these challenges? Because then we have a way. If there is a will, there is a way. Always there is a way. So understanding that you are always in power and understanding how much power is inside your heart. When you come to your heart, most of your problems is created by your mind because your brain is designed on survival to keep you alive, never been designed to keep you happy. So that's why the brain never been designed to help you to take any decisions. The brain is there to send you a lot of alarms on everything that you shouldn't do. But if you connect your heart, your heart always know the answer. So tap into the power of your heart, ask, and I shared in my book also how to ask your heart, how to tap into the heart intelligence and how to ask your, your heart and how to receive answer. Once you know it, nobody can get it away from you. It's very different with what you believe because the belief is from the mind and the knowing. So every single person who come from adverse um, background or is experiencing some kind of adversity right now in their life, you know in your heart, you know in your heart that you are guided and supported and loved. And if you don't know, create some moment to connect to your heart and turn off that mind chatter and it'll allow your heart to guide you into to listen to your intuitive message that comes from your heart. Because in mind, we have always these two voices, right? But in the heart, is pure, is knowing, is the, is the ocean of infinite love and infinite well-being once you tap into this, this, this power inside you. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> and Dr. Kalen, how do you work with, with people on empowering them and instilling in them this, this unconditional love that is out there and the power they have to change their lives how do you view that how do we how do you work with people when i as i think about this um truly the challenge is the good stuff 
hold on, there's more, like, don't get offended. Um, because you said, you know, there's a three of us here, we're doing relatively well, successful, da, 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 right? Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm happy. That doesn't mean anything. It just means that this is where I've landed, you know? But um, just like so many people out there, I've had my own struggles, and some of them have been enormous. Um, you know, my own trauma healing, mental health issues, just things that have happened in my life. And some of them have been quite severe. And those even though I hate them and would never wish them on anybody, they are where I have learned my, my, my wisdom, my compassion, my ability to work with people with trauma, particularly sexual trauma and things that have just completely t- torn them apart from their connection with themselves is miraculous because I'm here for it. I get it. I can do it. And so the things, not just one small thing, but the things that I have gone through and the things that you have gone through are the bedrock. They are the foundation of your transformation and of you being, it's like a catalyst. You know, I think I talked about Joe Dispenza earlier. He talks about challenge as an initiation. It's not something that we want ourselves to go through, but we know of countless stories. I know of countless stories of people hitting rock bottom, totally bankrupt, this, 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 that. And then from it, they become like a rocket and they something inside of them comes alive. And it's that it's that duality, right? We go from the bottom and now we start to come up. And so the things that I have been through that have been the hardest are the reasons why I'm sitting here and doing what I do. They are the reasons for my success. They are the reasons I can help people. And it's my passion about that to pass it along is like, that's, that's my mission. That's my why. So it's not that we want to celebrate them and embrace them and like, Oh, cool. I love that. Everything is awful and it's falling apart and I'm going through tragedy. I think it's very important that when we are inside of those brutal experiences or whatever they may be, that we give ourselves as much compassion and kindness Mm -hmm. as possible. Mm -hmm. Without that, the burden can become so heavy that as, as you know, the whole, um, all the problems are really created in the mind, then it can become almost insurmountable. But my hack around so much of this struggle when I work with myself, which is harder with ourselves, but when I work with others, in order to get through, you have to be your best friend. You have to do the thing that you would do. You have to say the thing that you would say as if this were your best friend, your child, whatever, like that must come into play. That will save you. You have to behave like you are saving your life. Like you are going to do whatever it takes. And that for me has taught me such an enormous amount of self-compassion, which has saved my life and has helped me be my best friend through the hardest of things. But then now that I'm on the same page with myself, now opportunities become available. Now things happen and it helps me move through the hopelessness and the despair and the utter confusion. But those are also part of the experience. And so one of my favorite quotes is something like beauty and terror just keep going. No feeling is final. And I hear it in my head all the time. These downtimes, these struggles, these total pits that you can get into. They are the worst, but you can alchemize them. You can transform them into things that will create the life that you actually want. And then the ripple effect of that in this world is more powerful than anything that I think we can comprehend. Mm -hmm. So I just want to normalize it. Yes, things can suck. Yes, they can be totally scary. Yes, you might want to give up every single day, month after month. But that is also part of the human experience, which again, we're not supported or educated around. And really it's been from those bottoms that I'm at the top. When I'm at the top, it's kind of just like, meh, you know, you, you get to a, a kind of stable place and then things need to get rocked around again. So you can start to keep, get that momentum going. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't say, you know, here's the button for hope, but I, I just, I, I'm trying to emphasize how important it is. We normalize our experience around it that we use it to lean into ourselves and connect deeply with ourselves, which I do believe is a pathway to the consciousness and the divine and all those things that we're talking about. But the minute that we are splitting away from ourselves as Mm -hmm. our best friends, as our tether, now we're in trouble. But if we can keep that cultivated and affirm to ourselves as much as we can, like we were somebody we actually loved that it's, we're going to get through 
that -hmm. will save you and that will catapult you to wherever you need to be. And those are the things that I've had to do in order to survive and then to thrive and then move into periods of survival. It's another thing. Yes, you can be at a position of success or achievement or whatever. Like I've achieved a lot of things. I've lived a lot of dreams come true. But inside of that, there was still an enormous amount of struggle and trying to survive and then peak experiences of thriving. And so everything I just shared is what I've had to learn in that. And there is no placid point of arrival where you're just like, I'm good. I've got this, you know, because it'll just keep happening. And so cultivating that resilience. And then I would find finally say, we haven't touched on this yet. Stabilizing your nervous system in these experiences is also required. So whatever your resources, whatever your capacity, it's truly how can you provide some sense of peace and solace to yourself so you can downregulate as much as possible so you can get through these times. That's why I love the work that I do when we get to work with the body and the energy. We can pull it out of those fight or flight patternings that it gets stuck in for years and decades and most of our lives. So that way we can move through these experiences without creating more stress and more harm and more distress inside of ourselves. So being loving to ourselves, trying to create as much inner peace as possible just through breathing and regulating the nervous system and the energetics that we are. And then understanding that this is this is your launching pad. This is your catalyst. And to normalize that sometimes things are obscenely hard and eventually they'll get easier, but then they're going to get hard again too. And just riding in that with some degree of acceptance and separation from it, detachment, like, okay. And then when you do that as well, interesting insights and experiences and synchronicities also come usually when you least expect it that completely change your trajectory and help you get to where you were wanting to be anyway. Yeah. And, and I think this panel is a great example of, of what comes out of the adversities, right? Because each one of us has used these adversities to learn new things, to apply new things in our lives. And then as practitioners, pass that on to other people that are also struggling. And mm-hmm. many, many stories, if you look out there, the stories of, of some of the biggest speakers that are most well known, it's exactly that, that personal story with a lot of adversity that brought them to where they are now. So yeah, that's mm-hmm. a really great point. Now, I love that you've touched on um, downregulating the nervous system because we have not yet talked about building resilience or tools that we can use uh, in order to help ourselves with anxiety and fear. And so this is sort of the last part that I wanted to touch on is a few of the tools or interactive exercises that we can talk about now. Um, How can people put everything together that we talked about in this panel talk today in order to help themselves with anxiety, with fear, with healing the mind, with staying in peace, staying connected to the divine love that's out there. How do we put all of this together? Now, um, Shima, do you want to start us off on on maybe some exercises or tools that you have for that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, So we have a lot of different tools for managing our stress and anxiety, as Dr. Kelly also mentioned on some of them, like journaling exercise or practicing self-love is Practicing self-love, as she mentioned beautifully, it's one of the most important acts that we can ever do is underlying secret to our better health relationship and finances that I shared in the book is absolutely primary necessary to be our own best friend, to let go of those negative self-talks, to let go of self-blame, self-critical thoughts that are constantly destroying us and bringing us down understanding that we have the power at every single moment to change our life, understanding that we change our vibration, the world around us will change, our experiences will change, like the way we're going to change our emotions and thoughts. So I would like to share with you the, um, the experience from Hartman's, the, the heart brain coherence, that re- is really effective on uh, managing your, your stress. And also, when you're practicing it uh, enough, you're uh, going to activate the reverse aging in your body. So you're going to put your body on auto healing system. It's going to help you a lot in many different ways in your life. And um, 
the exercise, uh, we have scientific studies, and that's why I want to share that because many of many of us have this scientific mind, analytical mind, and want to have something that really has it's been backed up by science. So that's why I would like to share this one. Mm. So it's very very easy. It's a two step technique. The first one is that you bring your awareness to your heart. So you can do that simply by placing your hand over your heart in the center of your chest, more toward the left, or just put it on your heart chakra. Or you can simply close your eyes and try to look at your eyes from inside. You look at your heart from inside. So you bring the awareness to your uh, heart. You can maybe hear your heart rhythm. You may feel the pulsation of your heart under your fingers. Means you have your awareness on your heart. Slow down your breathing rhythm. Inhale deeply. And exhale fully. You can command your breath, slow down, slow down. As you feel how you're breathing with them, it's getting slower. You can sense this feeling of peace in your heart, in your body. And create an elevated emotion in your heart, care, compassion, gratitude. Care for someone you love, and you may bring their faces to your mind. Compassion for people you love. Or simply gratitude for this very moment. for the air you are breathing. And allow this beautiful elevated emotion, this feeling, this sensation of gratitude, compassion, care, to expand in your chest. and reaches every cell in your body. And feel how these beautiful vibrations filling up this space around you. And at this very moment, you have managed to create coherence between your heart and your brain. So congratulations, and you can open your eyes. This is a very simple technique. Basically, two steps. The first step, you bring your attention to your heart and slow down your breathing rhythm. And the second, to create an elevated emotion and allow that to travel in your body. You can do that at any given moment. You don't really need to meditate or be in a quiet place. You can do that when you're in a traffic jam or in the middle of a um, hectic discussion. But that immediately shift your state and create inner peace. And now if you stay in this long enough, then you really activate all the healing hormones in your body. 
because now your heart is telling to your brain, to your mind that I'm safe, and now we can work on the healing. So it's a very simple technique, two-step technique. I really recommend you to use it, and you can read about the benefits of it online. Uh, all uh, these now very famous New Age scientists, such as Greg Braden, Joe, Joe Dispenza, Bruce Tipton, they are all sharing this methodology of heart math and because of its uh, amazing effect. So we create this coherence before anything you want to do, before any decision you want to take, then it's easier to understand and receive your intuitive messages in your heart and also to understand which way to go or what decision to take. And um, it's gonna be a great accompaniment in your day. Plus you realize that you have been able in less than one minute shift your mindset shift your mindset from fear to gratitude that all the stress hormones in your body has been shifted and changed so just by one simple exercise so you you understand how much power you have by bringing your attention inward than just externalizing that attention and bring it to the outer noise yeah amazing i even feel like there's a shift in our energies after mm, we've done this now. <laughs> so yeah, amazing. Thank you for sharing that technique. And I hope our viewers did this with us while we were doing that and will continue yeah. to do that in their lives as well. Mm. And uh, Dr. Kalen, you mentioned down regulating the nervous system also as one of the things that you work on for people who might be stuck in that constant stress response and that constant feeling of uh, danger and, and needing to fight. Um, any tips on how people can do that and, and what they can do to downregulate their nervous system? Absolutely. I think overstimulation, um, busyness, paying attention to everything aside other than themselves. I always give the visual to, to people of instead of your awareness and your focus being in here, it leaves your body and jumps into everything else around you. You know, you care too much about what your boss said and you care too much. Like everything is very scattered and we naturally kind of move into that as we go about our day. So I'm all for little hacks and small things that we can do as reminders. I think Sure, if you could take a whole week off and just relax, that sounds great. And, you know, if you had all the resources in the world and you could see all the healers, that's great. But I actually found that what has been most effective for me and for everyone is a thing that we do ourselves on a daily basis, also supported by all those other modalities and things. But for me, what I originally started off with 10 plus years ago was a consistent morning meditation practice, which I can explain in a moment, and um, little reminders throughout the day of what I was trying to move myself into physically and mentally. Because once I would go back out into the world, it would get all scattered again. So the practices that seem to work very well for me um, are practices of detachment and reminding myself of intention. And I started that in like 2010, 2011. My health was very bad. Nobody could help me. My mental health, my physical health. I was afraid I was going to be disabled. Like nothing was going to work out for me. And that's when I decided to take it into my own hands and heal myself from the inside out and became very devoted to the practices that I'm sharing right now. But to downregulate, one of what we're really saying is to pull yourself out of that frenetic state. And when you learn how to do it for yourself to some degree, even if it's not 100%, you get relief. And if you get relief, then instead of at the end of the day, you being at 150%, you maybe be at 40% stressed out and frazzled. So practices of detachment would be like meditation, which is, you know, you may have heard you sit and you breathe and you focus on your thoughts and nothing else. Sure. But the one that came to me as we were all talking is I got it from Louise Hay to some extent. She has a book called You Can Heal Your Life, which so many of us are aware of. And she has this great practice in there of just saying aloud to yourself. And I talk to myself aloud, out loud a lot to help me downregulate would be I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out and I'm letting go. And then she keeps adding, I'm letting go of fear. I'm letting go of this. I'm letting go of that. Say it out loud. The key thing here 
is as you say it, feel the emptiness of it. This works so well for so many of us because we're so used to feeling all this. It's like, well, what if I were empty of that worry? What if it were just out here instead of right up in here? Hmm. And I, I say, I practice a lot of being in the emptiness, being in the space between. And the more you do that, it's easier for you to not to get so caught up in it. So then when you're out in your day and something triggers the life out of you, it's easier for you to remember how to down regulate. So down regulating practices are something that you do all day long. There's, well, maybe somebody doesn't have to, but I certainly, it's important for me to know how to down regulate, being aware of the things that might set you off and being aware of how to set the tone for your day. So simply said, getting started at the beginning of your day in some way, even if it's just in the bathroom and you're hiding from your kids or something for five minutes, you breathe, you connect with yourself, you say what your intention is, you feel yourself move into some state of peace, like in the meditation we just did. And then throughout the day, you try to find a way to remind yourself of that feeling. And then if something is particularly overwhelming, obviously you get help if you need it, but find a way to give yourself a little bit of space from it, feeling the emptiness of it, and then observing it. And then I'll do a lot deeper work with people about why that was so activating. Once we learn why things are setting us off, then we have the power to protect ourselves from them or just for them to be nothing to us anymore. But I have found actually that with everybody, that's probably the strongest piece of work that we're doing. Whether they're running their business and they're afraid about what's to come next, or they hate their jobs, or they're, you know, whatever it is, um, we must help them create that space and that down regulation so they're not no longer caught up in it. And when you're no longer caught up in it, now your body settles and you've gained control over the domain of your energy and your body. Now you have the power to do something differently. But for me, it is daily practice, just like if somebody's working out and they want to, you know, build muscle or you do yoga and you want to deepen in your practice. To me, this is energetic hygiene. This is one of the most important things because we live in a very saturated and over stimulating type of reality at this point. I think it might be more important than it's ever been. 10 years ago, it was easier for me to find quiet and downregulate than it is now. Yeah. Yeah. I find that too. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of people would agree with that as well. Mm -hmm. That's what we're finding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, ladies, we have reached the conclusion of our panel talk on breaking down barriers, discussing anxiety, fear, and the mind. And I really hope that this enlightening and thought-provoking discussion has provided some valuable insights and some practical strategies for understanding and navigating these important aspects of our lives. So I'm just going to take a moment to summarize the key points that we explored in our talk today. So we began by understanding the mind, some of the theories and how it influences our thoughts, emotions and behaviors. And then we delved a little bit into mental health and exploring some of the challenges and, uh, and how we can maintain some of the mental health and capacities to change our mind to support mental health. We explored consciousness and the impact on our perception of how we live reality, discussing the different kinds of consciousness and the connection to the mind. And we continued by shedding light on anxiety and fear, defining them and exploring what triggers them and discussing some of the holistic approaches to manage those. And finally, we just discussed some of the empowering personal resilience as a means to navigating anxiety and fear with strengths and adaptability and some actual practices that we can do to help ourselves with that. Now, each of our panelists has shared their unique insights and experiencing shedding light on the topic from diverse perspectives. And I'm so grateful for each of your expertise and contributions to this panel today. And I would like to just take this opportunity to express my very heartfelt gratitude to Shima and Dr. Kalen for sharing their valuable knowledge and engaging in this discussion. Your expertise and perspectives have really enriched our understanding of this hugely important topic. And I would also like to extend our sincere appreciation to all of you, our virtual audience, everyone who is watching, for watching this panel talk and talking about these topics that are so important in this world today and in our lives. And as we conclude, 
I would suggest that we encourage each and every one of you to continue this conversation beyond this panel talk. So let us break down the barriers surrounding mental health, anxiety and fear by fostering these open discussions, supporting one another and prioritizing our well-being and our awareness and education around these topics. Remember that change starts with each individual and collectively we can make a significant impact as we talk about these topics. So on behalf of our panelists, I thank you once again for being part of this panel discussion, this little event that we've put on and we wish you all the best on your personal journeys towards enhanced well-being, holistic well-being, more happiness, more health and a deeper understanding of the mind, mental health, and consciousness as we talked about. And would any of you like to say some closing words as we finish our panel talk? Thank you so much, dear Petra, for inviting us here. And I thank you so much for your great, beautiful insight, Dr. Kaling. And thank you, everybody who listened to us and who, who've been with us until this moment. And I just want you to remember how beautiful you are. Nobody told you today, you are unique. You are beautiful and you are loved. Remember that. So lots of love to you and you're always in power to create a massive change in your life if you decide. Lots of love Thank you, that. Shima. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here for this conversation. I love how it evolved. I loved how we all came together and added depth and authenticity and our voice to this. And we are just like everybody else in the world, you know, we're all on the level playing field. We all have some something to, to add to this. We're not doing this alone, we're doing this together. And some of us may have some wisdoms and insights and we can share it, but everyone out there does as well. And I, I do feel that we're all doing this together. And I really want us all to do this together. And it's for us and for everything to come, it's for all people. So this is just one facet of the conversation, but my, my hope as always is that it inspires somebody out there. It lights that thing up in them that's already lit that maybe they just were not necessarily aware of or didn't have a relationship with. that gave them some spark of insight or inspiration or particularly validation that then supports you in moving forward in whatever it is that you're wanting to move forward in. Yeah, absolutely. And it is something that we all need to do together, support mm -hmm. each other through talk about and bring out into the world. So thank you everyone for spreading this message and for supporting the talks about this and opening up and being open to listen to this and then listen to the education that's out there about that. So yeah, thank you everyone. And thank you panelists. Thank you, Dr. Kaylin. Thank you, Shima. And everyone take care and be well.